Chalk Talk is about tiny bubbles. But not just any kind of tiny bubbles. Tiny bubbles that can cause a bunch of problems. And no, I'm not talking about that one time when your phone decided to take a bath. I'm talking about outgassing. When tiny bubbles escape from organic materials when pressure changes. And specifically, I'm talking about outgassing in space applications and what you can do to stop these tiny bubbles from wreaking all sorts of havoc in your next space application. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Scott Miller from Cinch Connectivity Solutions and I chat about the what, where, and how of outgassing in space applications. We explore a variety of issues that can be caused by outgassing in these applications and how you can mitigate outgassing in space applications with Cinch Connectivity Interconnect Solutions. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Cinch Connectivity. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about outgassing today, a hidden danger in harsh environments. But Scott, before we dig into the solutions in this space, what kind of design considerations do we need to keep in mind when it comes to interconnects for these kinds of environments? Certainly, there's a lot of opportunity for design engineers out there to select the right interconnects for their space program and their space applications, whether they're vehicles or satellites or other systems that are going into outer space. And, you know, they're really looking for a product that is highly reliable, can work in harsh environments, field proven. So they're in space or they have been used in space applications in the past Just living and existing in space is a volatile environment, but also, if you think about it, getting to space is even more a challenge. When you think about, you know, the launching of these vehicles into outer space, significantly high vibrations, significantly high shock, high temperatures, just the whole gamut of harsh environment is in the launching of the vehicles or systems into outer space. And then when you get there, it's very much a dynamic atmosphere out there or environment out there that is very difficult to have product existing and functioning out there, such as satellites and things like that. That makes sense. So before we go any further, Scott, what exactly is outgassing? Outgassing is what happens with organic materials. So materials like plastic and rubber materials that we use in the interconnect products to help them perform and seal where you need the rubber elastomers to help you seal the connectors or interconnect products. The plastic is used and composite materials are used to support the electrical transfer of information or power and you need good insulation there and you also need we prefer using in our interconnects you know some sort of metal housing and that metal housing needs to have some sort of what we call plating or finish over it so it can survive in the environment of space. And so when you go to manufacture these type of interconnects here on Earth, you're in a certain pressure level and it's a moderate pressure level. But when you get these interconnects and other products that are part of the space systems out into outer space, you almost have no pressure out there. And what happens is these organic materials can start to create with that pressure change from when it's manufactured to when it gets to space can create some air bubbles. And these gas bubbles can start to build and they start to want to get out, I guess, get out of where they're at. These bubbles can cause damage, not only to the interconnect product, because now you have these bubbles trying to escape they're also starting to damage or create cracks to the various components of the interconnect product or other products in space. And so outgassing can then cause other systems around the interconnect product 
to become compromised. And so these products can become compromised and then they don't function as well. So this outgassing thing is a pretty big problem in space applications. So, Scott, can you share some examples from the real world where outgassing caused problems? Yeah, there's a couple of real specific space applications and projects that back in the 1990s, one of them in particular was the Cassini spacecraft, which was sent to outer space to go analyze one of the Saturn moons, which was the Titan And essentially, they wanted to try to take some images of that moon. And so they sent a spacecraft to go do that. And they spent a lot of money to get that spacecraft up into space, developed and validated and sent up into space and a long trip out to the Saturn moon, the Titan moon out there. And there was some outgassing that was happening around some of the cameras that were there to take really good images and send them back to Earth. And so this outgassing, these air bubbles caused a thin film coating over some of the cameras and it caused some blaring and really made some of the images low quality. And so that was a big problem because they spent all this time and money to get this spacecraft out to that moon near Saturn and turned out that some of the images weren't as good as they expected them to be. And that was later found to be an outgassing problem. Another example was the Stardust space probe. That was launched also in the late 90s, and that was sent out to outer space to get close to a passing comet that was going near Earth, probably pretty far out there, but it was going near Earth, and they sent a probe out to that area. So when the comet passed by, the probe could then be part of the debris that is left by the comet in space, and what they were trying to do is they were trying to collect some of those particles, some of those gases, some of those materials that the comet was leaving behind as it was traveling through space. And it turned out that the sensors that were gas detecting sensors on this probe were left less accurate because of outgassing near that area created these sensors not to function as well. And so the folks on Earth couldn't tell if they were getting a good amount of gas and particles when they were going to do the collection of it. And so the sensors weren't really being able to tell them with as good of accuracy as they wanted to, what particles, what they were getting, what the material was like, and so on and so forth. So it was a big problem. The project was slightly compromised because of the outgassing. So, Scott, NASA has standards specifically for outgassing, right? Yes, they've got several of them. There's all sorts of different organic materials that are used in the manufacturing of the spacecrafts that go out there, probes, satellites, vehicles, the International Space Station, et cetera. And so there's all sorts of different systems that go out, and including on the interconnect side of things where you're connecting one system to the next, a sensor to a subsystem or what have you. So NASA has developed over the years several different techniques and procedures and policies that you must try to remove or de-risk outgassing from all the systems out there that go up into space. So that's what they've been developing over the years. So Scott, what can we do to help solve these issues? Well, first and foremost, one of the things that NASA has produced over the years is kind of a material selection guide, if you will. So when you're dealing with organic materials like we have to with our interconnect product, they tell you, they give you some suggestions in terms of what organic materials to use. And so we follow that. However, the biggest thing that we do, we use the ASTM E595 approved NASA specification to go through and we take our product that we manufacture here on Earth and we put it through an outgassing process. And what we do with the materials such as certain rubbers and plastics will select, certain platings that will select, such as electrolyst nickel is a type of plating that's very good for these environments. That's also a little bit lower risk of outgassing. And we take our interconnect products and we expose them to a thermal vacuum bake-out process. And we essentially take the product in its finished condition and you put it into a thermal vacuum chamber at a certain temperature, such as maybe 125 degrees Celsius, and at a certain level of pressure. And you will sit in that chamber for 24 to 48 hours, depending, 
And essentially what that does is that reduces the amount of outgassing that is possible for these organic materials when they're in space and they're now in this low pressure environment. And so what they ask you to do is you need to get your product to a state where the TML, the total mass loss is less than 1%. And the CVCM, which is the collected volatile condensable material, is no more than 0.1% of the mass. So that's what we try to achieve with our products before they're used in space applications. So cinch connectivity has quite a history when it comes to interconnects for space applications, right? Yes. We've been in business for 107 years now. We started in 1917, but we developed and started to focus more in the interconnect product set over the past 60, 70 years. And one of the markets that we served even back in the 1960s, over 60 years ago, was the space programs that NASA was working on. Programs like the Apollo missions, the Voyager probes, the Beagle 2, Mars Lander, and various satellites that have been going up into space for the last 60 years and even to today. All the satellites that are going up for low Earth orbit, Wi-Fi to the world, straight to device connections that are happening, making it more available for people to use Wi-Fi but also use cellular service in remote areas of the world. And so we've been part of these programs for a really long time. So we have a great amount of history and heritage working in the space environment and supporting various space programs with our interconnect products. Fantastic. Now, Scott, what kind of solutions does Cinch offer today for these kinds of designs? It's a great question. We have all sorts of different types of interconnect products. Our core competencies are in the traditional power and signal, interconnects, input-output connectors, optical products, both passive and active optical products, as well as radio frequency, what we call RF interconnects, and that's for higher frequencies. And so we utilize that. That's kind of our core capability. And so we produce products such as our micro D sub connectors that are great. They're high reliable. They're used in space. So they're space ready. They're small. They're lightweight, but you can do a lot of signal and power transmission between spacecraft communication systems and between the sensors and the cameras with these lightweight interconnect products, such as the micro D subs and even our microcircular interconnects as well. We also, as I mentioned, RF. So we have products that are space ready, space proven for high frequency transmission of signal in space with our MIL standard 1553 data bus products some of our microwave RF attenuators, and even our millimeter wave, really high frequency, up to 110 gigahertz products that are used not just in space, but also to support ground communication into space, but also as well as supporting the launching. Obviously, everything going to space has to get launched. And so we have a lot of products in both the traditional input-output power and signal, but also at the high frequency with the RF products. And kind of the third leg to it is our optical side of it. So if you need high speed, if you need large bandwidth, traditionally we'll need to consider not using copper as the way to transmit your signals, but you can use optical where you're using glass and lasers and things like that. And so with that, we have our optical transceivers that we do, high reliability optical transceivers that are very good for optical connections in space. They're very robust, high vibration, high shock, so they can handle going out, getting launched into space. So some of the products that we have in our transceivers, optical transceivers, hybrid transceivers, things like that. Also in our optical product portfolio is our expanded beam interconnect. This is also an optical transmission for very high speeds and large bandwidth and and ease of use. If a copper connection is not getting you what you need, you can consider using some of our expanded beam passive optical transmission and interconnects to, you know, what the end user really needs for that application. All right. So before we go, Scott, can you recap your main points for me? Certainly can. I can mention Cinch has been around for a long time and we've been supporting space projects for a very long time and we make interconnect products and we can make them so they're space ready, space proven. And so our products are very much 
in tune with the requirements out there in space to survive in the space atmosphere and the launching of the systems to space. And so we're very excited and have been working in this space for a really long time, no pun intended. So it's really a lot of fun to get to work with some of the customers out there that are really designing these awesome systems that go out in space, the International Space Station, the satellites that are going out there, the probes, even some of the smaller CubeSats that are out there to do all sorts of really cool things out in space, you know, Wi-Fi and those type of things that I mentioned. And those are very good products that we brought and have been supporting in the space industry for a really long time. And we continue to develop new products that are applicable for space. And we're able to take those products and we have design intentions to create product that's obviously can be used in space. So we're looking at the NASA material selection guides and we're choosing the right materials to use. And then we do take that product and we put it through the outgassing to de-risk the outgassing with the thermal chambers that we use to reduce the volatility of the product when it gets into space. And we're very excited to continue that tradition and continue that legacy and heritage of supporting space applications with our InterConnect products. Fantastic. Well, Scott, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Cinch Connectivity Solutions. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. If you can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.